Be honest. Did you miss me? It's been a minute. It's been a minute. Things have been very hectic for me the past week, but I am back to talk some Mavericks basketball as we are now in the All-Star break. There are some notes of interest here. The Mavericks collected another nice victory over the Oklahoma City Thunder, minus Luka Doncic. It was not the prettiest offensive performance. In fact, the Mavericks were downright dreadful offensively, but they did get good looks. The good thing here is that the defense stepped up. I, I think collectively, one of the better defensive efforts we've seen for much of this year. And the result is that you win your ninth game in 11 contests. You are now back in the standard eight you know, 18 playoff picture. Granted, this is an unusual year for at least right now, this year by itself, the playoff picture is different. You're going to have seven through 10, basically in some kind of kind of play in tournament. And in that, you're going to have not seven versus 10 and eight versus nine. You're going to have seven versus eight with the winner of that. It's a single game. The winner of that getting the seven seed. You're then going to have 9 versus 10, and the winner of that game then plays the loser from the 8 seed game here. And so if you're in the 8 seed and you lose two straight, you lose to the 7 seed, the eventual 7 seed, and the winner of 9 versus 10, you're out. And whoever 9 versus 10 was has now stepped into the 8 seed. So the regular season, as it were could wrap up and you still, despite being in position for the playoffs, fall out of the playoffs. This is a one-year experiment, but given how successful the bubble was in terms of generating that interest late in those last few games before the playoffs started, I would not be surprised if this continues. So when you talk about like, oh, well, we're, we're in the playoffs, you could kind of expand that, but I think Mark Folliwell made a really good point the other day, he was on the ticket yesterday with Bad Radio, Bob Sturm, and Corby Davison, and he made the point that because of this situation, you'll probably see less major trade activity at the deadline than you normally would. The deadline's about three weeks out, but you'll probably see less major movement. Not to say that there won't be trades or that the Mavericks won't have any role in those, but because of that play-in option, even if you're the 9 or 10 seed, all you got to do is win two games and you're in the playoffs. That That's going to change a lot of teams' perspectives when it comes to whether or not they should sell at the deadline and just kind of mail it in the last six weeks or so of the regular season. That's very good context there by Mark, Mark Followell. I admittedly, I, I kind of considered it, but I hadn't really taken it to the full logical conclusion that he spelled out there. And so I would not be surprised at all if you have fewer major stars moving. That's not to say that there won't be stars who move or that the Mavericks can't get in on that market. But I think that's something to take into consideration as well, that this isn't like most years. Kind of like we've already been saying, but especially in another, in another key way here, it's not like most years. So in this case, there's a lot to take away from the Mavericks as of late. Like I said, they've won nine out of 11. They're in at the eight seed. But here's the thing. They've closed the gap. They are just two games behind five-seeded Portland. Remember how everybody lost their damn minds when Luke and I say everybody, everybody in Portland and in a national media perspective lost their damn minds when Luka got voted all-star starter over Damian Lillard? as if that was really like a significant thing that mattered, you're, you're an all-star. No one really takes note of who a starter is or, or not. So key to note there. But in this situation, you have now the Mavericks, and, and the key reason that they were citing that it didn't make sense for Luka to be in that position wasn't his personal stats. It was that, oh, well, the Mavericks are terrible. At the time, they were the 14, 14th best record in the West. They weren't going anywhere, and the, the Blazers were so much better. Well, now here we are at the actual All-Star break, and the Mavericks are just two games back. They're in the playoff picture, and they're two games back of Portland. That key argument washed away just in that development. The Mavericks still have things they got to work on. They're still a work in progress defensively, but I am 
encouraged by what we've seen from this team recently. It's gotten better. The, you know, not having to have Luka in that OKC game, that was an immediate red flag for me because OKC is deceptively good this year. They just beat San Antonio, who's a game ahead of us, I believe, right now. They just beat San Antonio last night. Uh, they, they've, you know, been very hit or miss. They'll win games against teams who are like, whoa, this Thunder team beat that team? And then they'll have some duds in there as well. So playing Dallas without Luka was a major, major uh, winnable game, you would think, for OKC. And yet it really didn't go that way. Dallas kind of controlled things, despite not having a lot of good shooting. Like the Mavericks were dreadful from three in the first half in particular. I want to say Bobby Corella had a... He had a tweet about it. I want to say it was like one of 17 or something. It was horrendously bad three-point shooting for the Mavericks, even though they were getting good looks. And KP, you, you would expect him to dominate a game like that, but he didn't. He had 19 and 12, and I think Hardaway had 19, and uh, was it Brunson who also had 19? You had three Mavericks with like 19 points. It was balanced production, but you didn't really get that game. Like last year when Luka was out at times, KP stepped it up, right, at Philadelphia, at Milwaukee. We were looking at KP, and you're like, there is that badass mother effer, and he is dialed in. You didn't have that. You didn't have that here. You had good, but not great. And usually, the the appeal of, of having a, a player of the caliber of KP would be that if Luka isn't there, he's capable of stepping into that role in you know, in short stretches of a few games here and there and playing at that superstar level. Didn't happen here. But that's okay because you get the win. You get a, a good defensive performance out of this team. So good, in fact, that the entire defense was christened, named, crowned. One of these words works, maybe. The defensive player of the game went to the entire team. Entire team. So... Here's the thing about that, right? Like, the, the Mavericks' defensive ranks before the belt were really good, and then they created the belt, and then they got really bad. Granted, a lot of that had to do with just the timing factor. Like, it happened to coincide with everything with uh, health and safety protocols that just devastated this team, made it very, very difficult to see a complete picture of this team, and, and it makes it uh, difficult to really pin together. I think a good perspective here, and I think this came from Saad Yusuf of The Athletic, but I think he was talking about it, or The Ticket was talking about it uh, the other day when he was producing for them. I think it was Saroy and Donovan Lewis who were talking about it. And they were basically were saying, you know, this Mavericks season, and they were referencing Saad's point, I believe, this Mavericks season is a tale of three teams. The first stretch... A little sluggish out of the gate, like five and four, but you had some quality wins in there. You had the 51 point beat down of the Clippers. You had wins over the Heat. You had wins, uh, win in overtime in Denver over a good Nuggets team. Like you had those highs, and it was still a little bit of a mixed bag, but you're like, all right, well, we're figuring things out. We didn't have KP for the, like the first 10 games, and now here we are. That's one chapter. Then you had 14 games of just chaos because of health and safety protocols, having as many as five or six players out. I think it was five at the height. You had the main four guys, and then you had Hardaway miss a game against Chicago, I believe it was, with the groin strain. But chaos. You go four and ten, and you plummet down to like 14th in the West. ESPN's over there like practically laughing maniacally because the Knicks have the Mavericks first round draft pick, and everyone's just like, oh! <laughs> it's falling apart in Dallas. They're not going to keep Luka. They're going to trade KP, blow it up. Like, no, no, no. And I admit, I got swept up into it as well. I did. I really, really tried to resist getting swept up into that negativity and that feeling that this team was garbage. I still don't think they're good enough. I still think they need to make moves. But this team is not, and I, and I said it a lot during that time, this team is not as bad as 4-10 and 10, as they were in that stretch. And some of that occurred even when guys started coming back, and so people kept losing their mind. For me, where it really, really, really became concerning was when it just looked like the effort and the, the preparedness 
wasn't there. Like, they didn't care that they were getting their asses kicked by Golden State in the fourth quarter of a game that had been just right there for them. But now, in the last 11 games, you have this new chapter. The team has actual momentum. And here they are. Their two losses in the last 11 games are against Philadelphia, who is unquestionably the best team in the Eastern Conference right now. Number one seed, obviously. And Portland, who you always play tough and is a a very good, capable opponent. Like I said, they're the five seed in the West. But Dallas versus Portland is always a stacked match. Even when Dallas has been really bad, that's always been a game decided within 10 points. And usually within about four or five points tops. Like, it's always a good contest against Portland. It's just that, in this case, they got the better of us. You know, they still have Damian Lillard. And we didn't quite have enough there on that given night. So there's a lot of reason to look at this team and say, things are trending in the right direction. Especially with the expansion of the playoffs this year, there's no reason to think this team will not be a playoff team. And I, I actually think they're going to be, you know, somewhere in that six to eight range. I, I still think that because of what happened regarding health and safety protocols, they're not going to have the time to make the real charge. Even though I said it earlier, they're two games back of Portland at the five seed. That's really critical. That's really important context. But it still feels like it's a little bit probably too far out there because I imagine we're going to have more games where KP has to sit, you know, and we don't know what's going to happen at the deadline. Maybe that changes this and I got to revisit this conversation sometime in the next three weeks between now and the actual deadline. But I just get the feeling that this team is good and they don't, you're, you're not going to see them be a team that opponents want to face in the playoffs. Like there are years where health and all sorts of factors will let really good teams, really dangerous teams, especially if they dial in, slide back in that playoff picture. And then the teams on the upper half who didn't really have those trials and tribulations throughout the regular season, they match up with them and they're like, oh, shit, why did we have to get Dallas in the first round? Nobody wants to face playoff Luka. And if KP is here and he's healthy and he's gotten some form of momentum, maybe the defense comes back just a little bit, at least in terms of movement and lateral ability, then that needs to be visited. Now, one thing Dallas has tried to do is they've tried to kind of change up. KP at times was just being used and abused in that pick and roll. The lateral movement on the perimeter is just eating him alive. And I think Carlisle is making adjustments. You know, maybe it's super late in the game to be doing this, but making adjustments now where he's trying to keep KP out of those situations where now he can just headhunt a little bit for those blocks around the rim. And it's like, hey, what a concept. If you take the the area of this guy's game where he's best, where he's elite caliber, and let him stick to to those elements without making him do all this other crap that he's bad at, he plays better on that end. Huh. That's that's like the most brilliant epiphany I've ever had. Good God, man. Who do I tell about this? I gotta write Mark. Yes, Mark Cuban. Yes. Never mind who I am. I'm just a dude on the internet. Listen, I figured out the answer to how to get KP to play better on defense. I know he's been really bad there, but look, he's really good at weak side blocks, cleaning up the weak side, help side defense, getting those blocks when, yes, yes, exactly, exactly. I knew you would understand. Look, I think that what you need to do is put him in those situations more and out in the pick and roll on help less. Don't let opposing teams target him, but put him in areas of strength. I know, I know, it's crazy, right? Look, just, I'm not going to say that you got to thank me or something, but I do accept Venmo. Uh, Hello? He hung up. (laughs) But anyway, the team has momentum. We're in the all-star break. We'll see what happens with this. They'll get a little bit of time to rest. We'll see what they do come the deadline. I really hope they still make a move. The thing is, the fact that they are 9-2 and two in their last 11 tells me they're more likely than not to play it safe. 
I don't like that here. I'm not saying you gotta, I, I'm, I've moved off of the not blow it up thing. I never said blow it up, but I said you needed a substantial deal that involved a lot of players. Maybe you don't have to do that because you get a third team involved. Hell, there's trades you see that get a fourth team involved every year. Make something happen where you can get into that deal. Make something happen where you bring in something. Jalen Brunson is playing great. He's having the best year of his career. He is the secondary playmaker for this team. Trey Burke has kind of fallen a little bit back in that regard because Brunson, now that he's finally healthy and confident, he has stepped beautifully into that role. And he is reaffirming his value. I don't want to lose Brunson for, for I don't want to say for anything because that would be disingenuous. I don't want to lose Brunson. If we're going to make a move, I want to hang on to Brunson because it's too critical to have another guy that can properly create like that alongside Luca. Trey Burke is capable, but Trey Burke is not a great option. He's a nice option to have off the bench, and he certainly will have his moments. And that doesn't have to be his like 37-point game or whatever against Houston in the bubble last year, but he'll have his moments. Was it 37 or was it 31? I digress. He'll have his moments, but Brunson is a much more smooth, even-handed player in that role that you want to have, more consistent. So I want to stick with that. I want to see what they're able to do, but they need to address some things. If they're not going to look at addressing rebounding with a, a true big, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what their thinking is, but I'm hoping that they don't just look at this and say like, well, you know, we were just finding our stride at the beginning, but we had some good wins. Then, you know, oh, things out of our control. Couldn't do anything here. And then, oh, look at this. This is a better snapshot of what our team actually is. And there you go. It's a much better team. It's going to be much more competitive in the West. And we don't have to do a whole lot to it. We don't have to make any substantial change because all they need is momentum. And they're finally building momentum. I don't want that. I don't want that mindset. That's, I think that's counterintuitive in this regard. I think it's, being reactionary because 9 and 2 is great. It's also a pretty small sample size when we're talking about a team that has played how many games actually have we played now? The Mavericks have played, let's see, they're 18 and 16. So my crude, crude mathematical skills tells me that's 36. 36 games. Yes. Man, I really suck at math. That's fine. I'm a writer and a journalist. But even still, this team, that's a much larger sample size. So if you're going to say 4 and 10, you know, I get it. There's circumstances there. But that's a bigger snapshot than 9 and 2, than 5 and 4. So don't look at it and just say, things are working now. Ergo, we don't need to do anything. Keep aggressive. And I know you'll get some time after the All-Star break to keep seeing, and you'll be able to grow that sample size a little bit. But even though things are trending in a good direction, it doesn't mean you have to make a substantial move that now throws things back a step before it can start building forward again. But you at least need to make some kind of move that just infuses a little bit. You know, address one of your main weaknesses. Address the rebounding problem. I, I don't necessarily think you need a shot blocker. I don't want to see. I don't want to see us make a trade. Like, I know people have talked about JJ Redick, and there's stuff talking about him as a possible target for the Mavericks. That's nice, but some of the deals I've seen to acquire him are trash. I've seen Bleacher Report articles talking about sending Dorian Finney-Smith and Maxi Kleba to the Pelicans for freaking JJ Redick and like a second-round pick. Are you out of your damn mind, JJ Redick? He's a very good three-point shooter. He's also a bit long in the tooth. He's been around. I don't know how much fuel there is in the fire. That's not to say that he can't still be a major asset to your team, especially a team that at times, again, during that 4-10 and 10 stretch, was the worst three-point shooting team in the league, bar none. I don't give up Dorian Finney-Smith or Maxi Kleba if I have to. Like, and, and the frustrating thing about that, and somebody on Twitter pointed this out, and it's not a, it's not a Mavericks personality that I know in Mavs Twitter. So I, I'm sorry if I can't give credit to you on this because I didn't snapshot it. I just remember seeing it. Uh, the guy was basically saying, like, making a, a point of, if you actually read the article of what they describe Maxi Kleba as, they clearly have no f f 
uh, as I dial it back, let's let's retract that f bomb <laughs> before it leaves the lips. YouTube's a little temperamental on this front. You're out of your mind, and you don't know what the f you're talking about. If you're gonna say Maxi Kleba is not a good defender on this team. He's a big that can step out and shoot threes pretty competently. You know why they say that? Because they looked at the box scores and the stats and they said, oh shit, oh, as I curse again, whatever. It's not as bad as the F-bomb. Like, oh damn, as I do it again, <laughs> whatever. I'm a little rusty. He's shooting like 47% from three. Well, this is his benefit. He can do this for a team. He's not much of a defender. Maxi Kleba is a very good defender, but the stuff he does doesn't show up in the stat sheet, right? He, he's a good perimeter defender. He can make things difficult for you. If he'd even watched the Mavericks at all against the Clippers last year in the playoffs, he'd see he was about as good as anybody the Mavericks threw at Kawhi Leonard. And I understand Kawhi had a great series, but if you actually watched it, you know Maxi, in a lot of times, did everything you could possibly ask, and Kawhi just made a better move. Good offense beats good defense. That's what it was in a lot of situations. Maxi might not be an elite shot blocker, but he averaged 1.1 blocks per game last year. And he's a guy that can move his feet really well and actually guard in pick and roll situations. He's valuable on that end. So for you to say, like, give your best 3 and D and arguably your best, your second best defender, or I guess third, because, you know, you got to give Richardson love. Give two of your top three defenders for J.J. Redick in a second. <sighs> Whew. You're out of your mind. <laughs> Whew. I got palpitations from that. You're out of your mind if you think that's the deal we're rolling with. I'm interested. And I, I've seen other ones that talk about like, well, okay, well, what if you also threw in like Lonzo? Luca, I mean, Lonzo's a good player. I don't think I don't think he's like great, great, but I think he's a good player. But I'm content with what I got in Luca and Brunson that I don't feel like I need to go chase an, another guy that can you know handle the ball. And he's a decent three-point shooter now. He's improved a lot in the last two years on that front. But it's like, do I, do I give up those two really good defenders to go get Lonzo and have a third ball handler who's a capable player but not a major need for this team? No, I don't. I don't know. There's a lot to talk about. I know a lot of people also throw names around like they always are interested in like the Victor Oladipo situation. I don't think Houston's going to trade him within the division. Not the divisions really matter, but it is an in-state rival, and Houston's very aware of that. So I don't think they're going to trade him here. You know, other situations that we've talked about, like, um, you know, would they go after this guy or that guy? I, I don't know. Th these are just some of the ones that I've actually seen murmurs of in recent days. I'm still interested in what the situation for uh, Drummond would be. I would like to see what that picture looks like and what they're actually needing because I know Dallas isn't interested in trading for him from what we've heard, although that could be a smokescreen. But, you know, the buyout market, I, I've seen stuff tying Drummond to, I think it was the Nets, and that's easily where he would go. So I, I don't know, man. There's a lot to consider. There's a lot to ponder. But the good thing is, for the first time this year, we actually have really good momentum. Now, I know we had a stretch there where we won like four or five consecutive games. Did it go to six? No, the losing streak went to six. That was bad. Where we've got momentum, and it might not be a huge winning streak, but it's a really good stretch of basketball here. Not everything is fixed. There are major problems that still need to be addressed if you want to go where you got to go. But it's fun to have these conversations when you don't have to operate from a world's on fire. <laughs> burning situation but that's my time for this video thank you so much for watching don't forget to drop a like leave a comment below subscribe to the dallas prospect check out my other content over at the kirby create podcast am i pointing to the right corner is it check out the content check out the other stuff we got rolling all kinds of great content inside and outside of sports until next time guys remember every legend was once a prospect. I don't know why I had to make it weird at the end. Well, every legend was once a prospect. Peace. From prospect to legend.